good morning uh, everybody uh, my name is uh, murli krishna reddy i am the co chair for uh, fiki telangana state council on behalf of fiki telangana state council i extend a warm welcome to all the participants to today's webinar the webinar is about national education policy 2020 a game changer for telangana the format of the webinar is as follows there is going to be a plenary session it will last from 10 am to 11 am and uh, then there will be three breakout sessions subjects be sustainability blended learning student outcomes then there will be a this breakout session will run from 11 to 12 12 pm then we will have a concluding session which will be from 12 to 1:30 pm in the concluding session the moderators of the breakout sessions will make presentations giving recommendations and there will be responses and conclusions at the end coming back to today's plenary session the keynote address is going to be delivered by mr devashish chatterjee director indian institute of management kozhikod the theme of his address is going to be making telangana a global hub for higher education i extend a warm welcome to mr debesish chatterjee the other esteemed speakers are professor sabu padmadas associate dean international university of southampton mr caesar wasen director international affairs qatar university then finally dr ashwin fernandez regional director of qs in middle east north africa and south africa the other speakers will be the topic of world class universities lessons from top ranked institutions national education policy 2020 is an important milestone in the history of education of india india is aspiring to be an emerging power to play an important role in the world and education is going to be the key for achieving that aspiration education is the way forward for india to play an important role in the economic and geopolitical arenas the salient features of national education policy which is already in the domain is a voluminous document and it is looks like it's going to be a turning point in the direction the salient features of this policy as i understand or gross enrollment ratio to go up then to introduce flexibility into a system which has been broadly rigid so far and then throwing open the education field to the big players in the world inviting the top 100 international universities to come and start their branch universities here and finally quality upgradation in the system that which is very important particularly in the public university system making telangana a global hub for higher education is going to be a great aspiration and a big challenge the policy alone cannot deliver this implementation of this policy in a creative way and with full commitment will pave the way to achieving this goal 
And I conclude, in conclusion, I once again welcome all the participants and I extend a personal warm welcome to the esteemed speakers. Now I request Mr. Debushi Chatterjee to deliver the keynote address. Thank you. Over to you, sir. sectors in uh, today's uh, plenary. The National Education Policy 2020 is a futuristic document that rises on the back of the COVID crisis. From my perspective, this represents a golden crisis. The agility of a virus exposes the fragility of a knowledge ecosystem of the 21st century that is rooted in archaic models of the British industrial world of the 19th century. Leadership in 2020 will be about seeing what everybody sees, however, thinking in a way that nobody else thinks. Post-COVID threat of extinction of the dysfunctional education system, it is a disruptive force between the new you and the old you. Come to think of it, the greatest innovation of life is death. It's not me who says that, it's Steve Jobs who said that. Because death invests life with strategic shifts. The first intimations of mortality comes with the first visit to ICU, it helps you prioritize things in life. If you look at three icons of India, Arjun, Buddha, Gandhi, and you look at their transformation, you will see a similar pattern. Arjuna's transformation comes on the throes of death. Buddha's transformation happens while he was almost dying by starvation, and Gandhi's transformation came while he was thrown out of a train in South Africa. All three near-death experiences that helped them move the whole world. NEP 2020 is not as important as a policy as it will be as practice in the next two decades. The core shift is the very process of learning is going to change from silos of knowledge to multidisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, technology-enabled learning, deemed universities that are now doomed universities. We are now dreaming of universities where integration of multiple streams of knowledge and learning, 6% uh, of GDP of India, which is not a small sum of money, would be invested in education, positioning of wisdom and humanistic knowledge systems of India at the very heart of our moderate, modern knowledge society. This will be some of the high points of the policy. India attained political freedom in 1947, economic freedom in 1991, as you can see with, with this journey of political and, and economic freedom, we are almost, almost there in the top five economies of the world. And we are poised to attain our education freedom starting 2020. For the next 20 years, India will show up for sure on the map of the world as a global education hub. And Telangana, the city of Hyderabad will play a very critical role there. Briefly talking about I am Cori Code the Institute that I have been heading for nearly 10 years now, we have a vision called 2047, when politically independent India will be 100 years old and our institution will be 50 years old. And we are hoping that we will be able to disrupt many things in the education space to stay relevant. For a long time, globalization of everything has been synonymous with westernization. In 2047, only one out of 10 human beings in this world will be from the Western world. In 2047, one out of five people in the world will be an Indian. Is it fair for the rest of the world, the Western world, to carry the burden of globalization on their shoulders, representing one tenth of the population? I'll leave that question to you. In 2047, 6 billion people in the world would constitute what you call the middle class. With little money, but with enormous hunger for learning, they will define the learner base for a network global university system, not a standalone university, mind you. India's 1,000 odd universities now will be about, about 5,000 universities in 2047, will cater to a world clientele of moderate cost, and high quality education globally. Like Australia wanting to become a global education hub in 2025, based on the twin pillars of multiculturalism and diversity, India has these two dimensions on a platter. 
India has cost advantage over Australia and indeed many other countries. With modernization of our infrastructure and the largest democracy traditions in the world, India will move ahead of Australia and indeed many other players in the education space. And Telangana in Hyderabad and the dynamic progressive leadership of its and the political will of its current leader, Sri K. Chandrasekhar Rao, KCR, in popular parlance, this place could well be one of the world's greatest education cities. Hyderabad has already demonstrated that it can host a world-class school. It is only a matter of time when the city has a great knowledge infrastructure and research ecology and the flow of funds required to make it into a global hub for education. In the 7th century and the 4th century and the 6th century India, Nalanda was recognized as a global education hub. Huan Sang, a Chinese traveler who traveled to India in the 7th century, he described the journey to India as a journey to the West. For all practical purposes, India was the West for China. India was considered the West, not because it was geographically the West, but it was very progressive in everything that China saw. Nalanda was the world's first university. Taksashila, established around 2,700 years ago, had 10,500 students from around the world, B bigger than what India has now. If there had been a ranking at the time, then probably most of Indian schools, in fact, the top 10 slots would probably be occupied by Indian universities and schools. So the onus of getting the world to study in India would rest on three pillars. And I hope that the government and the regulatory bodies around Hyderabad are listening. One is ease of regulation, two is quality of infrastructure, and three, marketing of our, of our knowledge systems. With this, we can attract at least 5 million international students to study in India in the next few years. We have to revisit the culture of giving, which India was known for and should continue to be known for. Now, I'm, I'm reminded by my first visit to Yale University with a bunch of you know, directors and vice chancellors as part of the Singh Obama uh, uh, agreement. We, re we realized that Yale University was funded by a donation from a carpet maker in Chennai, south of India. So you can look at the experiences of educational enterprises flourishing because of endowment, because of donation, because of hands-off contribution by the kings and the, and the business people and the powers that be, so that educational institutions could be run by educationally qualified experts, not by administrators. And that was India's greatest contribution. Uh, I had a conversation with the Dalai Lama who needs an introduction. And he, he said, in my third conversation with him, he said, India's best hope is by reviving its ancient teaching and its reverence for knowledge. The global warming that we see as a problem does not obey directions of east, west, north, or south. Global uh, warming is a global phenomena. It is not an ecological crisis. It's a human values crisis. And India has to come forth and demonstrate that its values are enduring and globally relevant. There are three values that I am Kodi Code has adopted for the future. One is Satyam, which is authenticity, Nityam, which is sustainability, and Purnam, which is wholeness. The real value of education is, the, is that education that liberates the learner. The Indian classical expression, Sa Vidya, Cha Vimuktai, means that education is truly education that liberates the learner from tags, from titles, from being politically determined not a victim of identity politics or digital dogma or market mechanisms. India's biggest export is, of course, the Indian Guru. I'm going to share with you a story before I end. I was in Ikalit in Nunavad, the northernmost state of Canada, and the only inhabited, the, the farthest inhabited space near the North Pole. And I was thinking I must be the first Indian to have arrived there because I came at the invitation of the local government and after my work was over in the course of the day, I was looking at a sea of ice everywhere where Eskimos live. And I thought it was a privilege to be the, to be the first Indian to be here. Then I realized that I was invited for a cup of tea for a conversation in the evening where 
a handful of Indians who actually lived there said that an Indian guru has come and he's going to teach a course. And would you like to join for a conversation with him? And then I realized that one of Indians biggest names hanging out there with a bunch of people doing meditation and, and, and learning uh, things that they have not, not, not learned before. And so you can see that India is present in the middle of the desert of ice. India will soon be in the middle of the global education hub and, and I'm not daydreaming, it, it's, it can really be true. And Telangana in the middle of India, India in the middle of a potential explosion of opportunities in the education space would be a place to look for. This may seem like a dream, but I would still like to cherish this dream. But I wonder, as I always do, where the deep dreamer is going to come from. Thank you. Namaste. A very good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to address all of you here for uh, the round table, which we are right now organizing and uh, the session uh, on Telangana as a global higher education hub, the way forward and lessons from global universities. Uh, I'm uh, your host, uh, Ashwin Fernandez uh, for this session. And before I introduce a panelist, I have a presentation to make to you, to share with you um, some takeaways from my side. I represent QS, one of, um, the university ranking uh, bodies, but rankings is not all we, we do. Uh, we do a, a lot of other things besides rankings, and one of them is thought leadership like this, uh, and bringing together people and leaders from around the world. And it's a pleasure and honor for me to address you at this forum, which is organized by Fiki. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's great to address all of you, and my special thanks to the organizing committee, uh, especially Sudhakar, for uh, putting his efforts into bringing this panel for you here today. So if I could have the screen shared, I can start off with uh, my session. So uh, the title which we are talking about today is Telangana as a global higher education hub. And to become a global higher education hub, I would like to use the word, uh, the word world class because that is what is the common term around the world for uh, in, for cities, for countries which are attracting uh, international students, international faculty, uh, doing great research and are able to build a hub out of uh, the higher education system. So the first uh, thing, let us look at the higher education system in Telangana and look at what aspiration we have in that case. Uh, we've seen that uh, Telangana has got about 24 uh, universities out of which seven are public, 17 are private. Uh, there are about 1,976 colleges as per the latest uh, AISHE uh, report. Uh, interestingly, in the Institute of Eminence project, we only have one university from Hyderabad, which is poised to make it uh, to, the, to the globe, basically. And uh, uh, you know, when we look at aspiration, definitely the state does have an aspiration of putting the University of Hyderabad there in the IOE project. There are also two institutes of national uh, importance, uh, which is the uh, National Institute of Pharmaceutical Education Research in Hyderabad and uh, NIT in Warangal. So definitely the state has got potential, has got the infrastructure in terms of the number of institutes which it could use to become a global higher education hub. So what are the highlights on Telangana? What sets Telangana apart from the rest of India and what should be the way forward? So there are about 1.5 million students enrolled in higher education in the state of Telangana. The GER for Telangana, um, which is 36.2, is much higher than the country's um, country's average, which is uh, 26.3. So that that's great. Also, the gender parity index is 1.18, which is about the average of the gender parity index of the country, which is 1.02. The faculty student ratio we have is also is also good at one point um, one uh, faculty to 17 students on average and that is much um, about the country ratio of one is to 26. 
also importantly uh, hyderabad uh, which is the which is the, uh, the 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 main city is amongst the top 10 cities that are uh, the preferred higher education destinations as per the latest mobility report um, from qsi gauge in bangalore um uh, 83.33% students want to pursue higher education um in the stem um stem field is what we have found out from that report as well so these are the highlights and uh, let's look at the internationalization of higher education in telangana because if you want to be a global higher education hub uh, you want to be world class you definitely have to be international and that's one of the keywords and um what we've seen at the moment the current uh, international scenario in telangana is that, that we just have 2020 international students enrolled in um, in the state of telangana when you compare that to i've taken three scenarios here one is uh, the new south wales and australia because that has that really attracts a lot of international students and as you are aware for australia um, education is the second biggest income generator after mining and coal. So when we look at just the province of New South Wales, there are about uh, 143,000 international students enrolled there. And why is that important? Because a recent study, which was done by a master studies uh, in Australia, made a direct link between higher ranking of an institution and as well the fees which were charged to students so better the ranking better the fees now i'm not saying that rankings always should mean that you are uh, charging higher fees but there's a direct correlation between uh, institutions which have greater um uh, a greater value in the in the market are ranked better have better quality and the fees they charge when we compare two of the panels uh, we have two panelists here today uh, one coming from qatar and i think qatar has got a very similar case study like uh, India and perhaps Telangana uh, very closely, and that's the reason why we've invited uh, Qatar University here because they, they are also a young uh, institution, I believe, and have a recent uh, a story of of progressing in the in the in the world. So there are just 1,250 international students in Qatar University, uh, and about 7,190 international students which are enrolled in the University of Southampton alone. So we're talking of a state here, Telangana compared to uh, universities which are on the panel. So we definitely need to push the internationalization agenda for Telangana if the state is looking to become an international higher education hub. Uh, so that's, the, that's one of the takeaways and one of the points to discuss later on during the discussion. So what is the current status? Now, I am not here to preach that uh, rankings is uh, the best way to evaluate a world-class status of universities or universities uh, it is just one of the mediums which measures performance of universities it is not the goal but the outcome of what universities are doing and i think i don't ever say that universe uh, that rankings is the only mechanism it is one of the barometers to measure the success of institutions in the current world university ranking now we've seen we have 24 universities uh, in um in in the um in the ranking from india in the last uh, uh, university ranking out of which just one is from telangana that's university of hyderabad as we move into the asian <laughs> ranking we have more institutions in there and uh we we have the first private inclusion in there by, by ICFI. so that's congratulations because what, what we see is that private institutions have much more agility to uh, support the agenda of being a world-class institution because uh, decisions can be made faster. So that is something, another takeaway is that uh, promoting private higher education as well, while at the same time and not making the difference between private and public, uh, I would say is, is the next one. Uh, as we move into uh, ratings, we've seen we just have one institute <coughs> from Telangana, which has been uh, rated by uh, by QS I gauge, which is VNR VGIT, which is a diamond college rating. So the state has a good potential to building a hub, and this is a good start, but it's a long way from where it needs needs to be. So what are the clear challenges for Telangana? So one is that uh, self introspection should be there. You should be self evaluating yourself. Uh, you might be good in a certain area, not be good in a certain area. Listening to your students is important 
taking their current views, perceptions is important in building the institution further. What is the other challenge is to do with data and process management? One is being lack of data and also uh, being able to uh, bring in international students. How do you promote international uh, internationalization and um, also get collaborations done on the international uh, arena? Uh, India particularly has its complex private, public, state deemed, and uh, as the previous uh, speaker said, we hope that these uh, demarcations also uh, move away in the future and we have um, a, a system which recognizes all institutions, uh, not as equal, but at least recognizes the existence of all institutions. Uh, and definitely there are stringent guidelines and policies for different types of institutions. And um, we hope that also is a bigger challenge for institutions to be able to build and further themselves in uh, in in uh, in Telangana. So <clears throat> the concluding part is, uh, and before I ask my panelists and introduce them, uh, what are the pillars? Uh, what are the four pillars to being a world class institution? So QS uh, says that you should have good teaching, you should have good research, you should be international, and your graduates should be employable. So these are four, these are not very, uh, I mean, they cover almost all areas of uh, of a university, but these are the four what we believe are important. Uh, I attended a presentation a few weeks ago uh, in which uh, Dr. Kareem Seger, the Chancellor of Ajman University, gave the five aspects of being world-class as per uh, himself and as per a university telling us. <coughs> so the first one is accreditation. Um, getting world-class accreditation, getting best practices uh, in engineering, in pharmacy, in uh, medicine, and all the areas which have got accrediting bodies. And I'm saying when, when we say accreditation, it's mainly international subject accreditation. Um, having good research, so kind of matches with the four pillars of QS, being international, okay? Uh, having good rankings and ratings is another aspect. Uh, but again, uh, these are in terms of outcomes not in terms of goals. And finally, branding the institution uh, as a world-class institution. So these are the five pillars. And um, we can we will open up the session to our presenters. So I would like to, again, uh, quickly welcome uh, two very dear friends, Professor Sabu Padmadas, which is the, who's the Associate Dean for International at the University of Southampton, and Mr. Cesar Wazen, was the director for international affairs at Qatar University. We have really had a good relation with both these institutions, and we would like to present the case studies. Now, this is the view from my side, what I believe are the prerequisites to being in, to being world class, to be a global higher education hub. So, let us hear from first Professor Sabu and invite Professor Sabu to share his views uh, for the next ten or so minutes. Uh, and then we'll ask uh, Mr. Caesar to come in and share his views, and then we'll open up the debate. Uh, so put your questions in the in the chat box, and we will then take it up with the panelists. So, so uh, over to you, Aprab. Uh, right. Uh, am I audible? Yes, uh, Sab, you're audible. You can go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin and uh, Mr. Sudhakar Rao for your kind invitation. And a very good morning to everyone. Namaskar. Uh, greetings from Southampton, where the sun has not risen yet. Uh, and indeed, you know, we all know that the sun rises in the east. Uh, I'm here today because of the passion and the inspiration from you all who are committed to transforming the higher education landscape in India. As we just heard from Professor Debashish, uh, who commented that for India, it is not just building, but rebuilding the foundations of a high quality education system, a gurukula system that probably existed centuries ago. So, but you know, the world has changed and we need to really move with the world. And without any doubt, the state of Telangana is ahead of curve by all means. Uh, there is this incredible commitment uh, of its, of, from the government. I could see that of its civil servants, particularly whom I, I mean, Mr. Naveen Mittal, whom I know, I mean, who's, who, who I believe is, is, is a real game changer in the state. I had an op opportunity to interact with him last uh, year and also heard him a few days ago at a, an event hosted by the British Council. And I, I'm indeed very happy to represent and share the experiences and lessons from my university and in fact, Southampton as a case study, 
Uh, we are ranked globally 90, uh, and, but I'm sure that each of those 20,000 or universities across the world contribute to the society and do a fantastic job in their own capacities and strength. But I firmly believe that Southampton could be somewhere up in the top 50 for various reasons. In fact, four of our disciplines are already in the top 50. So nursing, for instance, statistics and operations research, which is my own field, is ranked uh, 37 in the world. Engineering, particularly mining and mineral, which is ranked 40th. Archaeology, and there, 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 there's also another eight or uh, uh, subjects in the top uh, 100. Uh, so we have always remained modest, although very active and enterprising globally. But ref reflecting to what just uh, uh, Mr. Ashwin uh, said, uh, I think it's very important to really realize that branding and the value. And we are, Southampton is one of the founding members of the Russell Group Universities in the UK, known for high research intensity and international impact. Uh, we are also one of the founding members of the Worldwide Universities Network, and also a founding partner of what is known as a Set Squared, the university's business incubator is ranked number one in the world by UBA Global. So believe me, this is an institution where the microcosm hypermedia system was invented by Professor Dame Wendy Hall. And this was even before the World Wide Web existed or the protocols existed. And we have the privilege to have Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of World Wide Web, and Dame Wendy Hall and Sir Nigel Shadbold. Together, they established the Web Sciences Institute, which are really you know, emerging in, 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 our, in our modern world. A, we are able to communicate virtually through high-speed internet. We can watch high quality videos, transact you know, large amounts of data and even money across the globe in, in a fraction of a second, all made possible through a, a technology called optical fiber technology. that was invented by one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Sir uh, David Payne. Both Sir David Payne and Dame Wendy Hall, they love India, they frequently visit India and are also the honorary patrons of our university center, University India Center for uh, inclusive growth and sustainable development. And the research and innovation list goes from, goes on, com, you know, it's a long list from Cancer Immunology Therapy Center, a global hub promising. A, a, in fact, it is really almost confirmed that we will have a cancer vaccine within the next decade. From there to advancing climate change research, mapping global populations to uh, high impact, you know, social, economic and behavioral sciences research, uh, for example, including my own contribution of uh, working for nearly two decades uh, doing program evaluation uh, with the United Nations and the ministries of China to transform their historical one-child policy. So these are just some stories of how research can actually inform and impact uh, our society and economy. And all these highlight my first point of today's talk, which is research, research, and research. So every other week, we have successful research funding and publications in prestigious uh, journals like Nature, Science, and Lancet, and so on. Believe me, I mean, this was actually perhaps probably China uh, 20 years ago. This was never the case, but today's China, most of the universities have followed this kind of streamline of you know, publications of high impact, in, in, sorry, in high impact journals and so on. Of course, you get a pat and applause from the institution because you've published in the top journal, but the next question is that what difference your research has made to the society? What value it has added to changing uh, the society and so on? So recently, our COVID-19 research has been adopted by the British government, enabling a nationwide scale-up of a simple and non-invasive saliva testing procedure, which you can do it from home very conveniently. And so these are really, you know, inspiring uh, kind of uh, significant scientific developments and from developing a multi-diagnostic family testing kit to further scaling up an already existing drug, uh, synergent drug, the interferon beta drug to treat chronic bronchitis or em em emphysemia. And the same drug is now uh, proved effective for treating COVID-19 patients on ventilators at the ICUs. So the ethos or the guiding principle of Southampton University has always been changing the world for better through high quality, high impact research and research informed teaching, which is actually uh, quite fundamental. So we teach students our own research. Research is deeply embedded in all aspects of teaching and assessment. And our employers across the world have already acknowledged this particular strength. In fact, 
our education practices echoes what Swami Vivekananda said, uh, you know, is, is almost a century ago. Beyond padding information to nurturing values and making excellent global citizens, instilling confidence and character in young minds, expanding the strength of mind, intellect, and wisdom, and also enabling students to stand on their own feet, you know, to, 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 to make sure that well, they, they realize their strengths and to become more of a job generator than job, job seeker. Our curriculum constantly evolves to respond to global challenges and solutions. We ensure that space and opportunities in the curriculum development so that our graduates, when they leave the university, they know the real world challenges. Uh, to give you an example, we have a fascinating series of curriculum innovation or optional courses addressing global challenges. Uh, for example, these are very unique and uh, several, in fact, several other UK universities have also adopted this as well. And also in, in, in the state of Kerala uh, uh, a few years ago. So the courses range, for example, sustainability in the local and global environment, valuing nature, business skills, uh, ethics in the modern world, understanding modern China, social enterprise, and to my own uh, the course that I teach, an, indis an interdisciplinary course on global health, where I have students from anthropology, uh, engineering, chemistry, to business, music, and mathematics. So that is the beauty of, of really delivering these kind of uh, courses, you know, which has got this global angle. And any undergraduate student who at uh, can, can attend these courses actually these are credit bearing courses and they can come from any discipline so there is no disciplinary boundary next year we are launching a new course on emerging and resilient india this will expose our home and british students and international students to understand the dynamics and strengths of modern india its society the culture and the economic opportunities so therefore to reiterate our education system is designed not just to deliver subject specific curriculum and skills but it's actually designed to equally emphasize the interpersonal critical thinking and real world problem solving skills. And we are constantly in action uh, for innovation, experimenting different methods of assessment beyond conventional written examination. So I'm of the opinion that, well, we have to think beyond this conventional, you know, yearly annual examination and to something new. And that's fundamental. And the second important thing, which I think uh, Dr. Ashwin has already uh, mentioned, is the student experience. And that is also extremely important because there is, I mean, what we have done is that we have made significant investment in the infrastructure, so the campus, in terms of providing that atmosphere. We have a global lounge where, you know, where, where students from different cultures can come and interact. And in fact, one of the reasons for creating this infrastructure is to enable that integration, uh, cross-cultural integration, global networking and, and, and so on. So we have you know, other, other facilities in the campus that really excites students, induce students to come to campus. And from research to education, I want to quickly reflect on our strengths in internationalization and global engagement. So at Southampton, we have seen, we've just heard from uh, Dr. Ashwin that about, you know, we have got over 7,000 international students that's, that constitutes about one third of all students from over 138 countries. And our staff is also very global. I interact with colleagues from the US, from Mexico to Argentina to you know you name it, from India to China. So it's 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 that's that's the kind of broad spectrum of international exposure. We have also several excellent international partnerships with universities across the world, and we deeply value those partnerships and approach. Uh, and 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 the and the, and the main uh, kind of uh, angle towards here is that actually a win-win model of collaboration and not just competition, but it's a collaboration and growing trust and confidence. I think that's fundamental uh, for any partnership. And institutions should collaborate and help each other as we have common vision and shared goals. And our strategy is also fewer and deeper. And you know, in, in India, we have excellent ongoing uh, collaborations with government agencies, for example, Invest India, Niti Aayog, and a few other government institutions. IITs, Indian Institute of Science, Tata Institute, also excellent partnership with universities like Jindal Global University, GRD Group of Institutions, and recently TAPME, uh, one of the management institutions, where we have transformed these professional relations to, uh, you know, to become part of that wider family or network of universities. So it is not just about 
uh, you know, signing MOUs or, 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 or giving handshakes. But together in that spirit of partnership, we need to really uh, come together to transform the society and nurture the next generation. The opportunities, I believe, uh, I mean, I have had a, you know, a, a review of the national education policies. The opportunities are plenty. And we have, you know, from study abroad programs, two plus two, three plus one, different model pathways to join summer schools, conferences and workshops. And these enable students with that exposure. I think that's fundamental here. And we evaluate the difference. Uh, that's very important, especially as we know, these international activities come with a cost. And there has to be a social and a moral return to this investment. We make sure that there is also inclusivity equality and diversity in our, in our international student recruitment. We have, in fact, increased our investment in scholarships and bursaries, and also seeking CSR-type investment to support students from poorer social background. Finally, let me conclude this presentation with some very quick reflections on how we manage and sustain the world-class standards. I think it's all about self-realization is very, very, very fundamental. I mean, it's very key to building a world-class university. So we ask ourselves, what is our strength? What are we good at? What are we excellent at? Then we build on, uh, on those strengths and sustain those strengths. It can be small, big, it doesn't matter. I mean, you identify your strengths first and build on that. And more importantly, also effective governance and compassionate leadership is paramount to running a successful uh, university and sustaining the global reputation. And the leadership that we are referring here is uh, at all levels, from the chancellor, to president, to senate, councils, to departments, and to students. We, we need to really also see leadership in students. What we need is actually a flexible, apolitical, adaptive, and resilient education ecosystem. And, 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 and the key uh, uh, trust areas are empowerment, responsibility, and accountability at all levels. I think that's fundamental. We also need to be considerate and respectful to those who try innovative ideas, those who come up with new ideas, take moderate, calculated risks for a positive change. I think that's very, very important. We also know that the students are the pillars of our universities, and we need to also reflect on their needs and aspirations. This is exactly what uh, uh, Dr. Ashwin was uh, referring to. We need to identify their needs and aspirations and prepare them for a bit, you know, for better jobs or future jobs. In fact, most of the jobs that we, uh, you know, we we we, we speak of uh, uh, today, I mean, or you know, most of the future jobs do not exist at the moment as we speak. So the so-called Generation Z or the Millennium cohorts, uh, they they live in an era of uh, information revolution, and universities and colleges should face this ground reality. So we should challenge our students to reflect, to to, to think. Uh, differently, creatively, and innovatively. There is a fear that our universities and classrooms will cease to exist in the future. And I believe that this is nothing but it is a pure nonsense, because I truly believe that the universities will adapt and continue to grow, guide, and shape the next generation. Esteemed colleagues and dignitaries, I mean, let me uh, say something on behalf of uh, my president and vice chancellor of the University of Southampton. And may I convey the message that as a globally uh, ranked, uh, top ranked university, we welcome the higher education institutions in the state of Telangana to explore new collaboration and partnership opportunities with Southampton and also with other British universities. I mean, it is not just about one country or one continent. We have to think in terms of, you know, university as, uh, as a system for learning and for, for, uh, for advancing knowledge. And especially our India Center Center for Inclusive Growth uh, and uh, uh, Sustainable Development extends a warm welcome to you. We have also a Mahatma Gandhi tree on the campus, uh, planted by the uh, you know Indian High Commissioner uh, here in London, together with Lord Kamlesh Kumar Patel, who is a member of House of Lords and uh, the Mayor of Southampton. And this was actually planted on the occasion to celebrate the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. So Gandhi lives here, I mean, in the campus. In fact, Gandhiji set his foot first in Southampton about 132 years ago. I think it was the exact date is actually on the 4th of September 1888. Uh, so it's really long time ago. And this is the same place where Titanic also. Yeah. So, so, on, that, on that note, so, um, let me conclude I'm this in... talk and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Sabu. And uh, I'll come back to you with some questions I have. But over to, uh, to Sabu from Qatar, your time starts now. And uh, we'd like to hear from you. There is so much input given by Sabu. And I'm sure there's going to be still uh, you know, so, some case studies from you, some ideas and recommendations from you on what has been Qatar's strategy uh, in being a young institution. So over to you, Caesar. Uh, good morning. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, you know, I've been uh, listening very uh, uh, interestingly to all the uh, the uh, uh, previous presentations. And uh, I, I was first. I thought I was the first uh, one to uh, to join, like the early riser. But I I cannot beat both of you. So, and that uh, you know, uh, I'll I'll start directly with um, uh, explaining uh, a, a presentation about the uh, the, the situation. Uh, in Qatar in general and uh, Fukat University, let me share my screen with you. And then we'll, uh, of course, uh, talk about all the uh, other, answer any questions and discuss a little bit. So um, I uh, just checking if you can see my screen and, uh, you know, uh, I'll start directly. Um, yeah. So you might all know what the state of Qatar is, just for to point out, we are, uh, you know, uh, Small state, relatively speaking, and um, uh, Gul per Persian Gulf region. Uh, Qatar University is the national university. Uh, we have, uh, you know, um, kind of a, a traditional university setup. Uh, some of the facts are that you know we have ten colleges. Uh, we have twenty-three thousand students, three thousand full-time employees, forty-seven bachelor, uh, you know, uh, degrees, twenty-nine master's programs. 20 PhD programs, nine diplomas, and a doctor of pharmacy de uh, degree. Uh, that, in a nutshell, represents hope, hope, you know, mainly 90 percent of the population uh, of the higher education population in Qatar. That's why I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, mentioning that. Another area of concern, of interest for us that you know meets what Professor Sabo was talking about is research. You know, research centers have grown a lot. And um, when I received my, the invitation, of course, we all know about India and the push that India is doing in the region, you know, uh, confirming its status of superpower, but also with the you know, new na national education policy, with the new um, you know, uh, focus that, that is being done on internationalization. I tried to see the similarities, and I, I saw that a lot of similarities in, uh, you know, uh, exist between uh, Hyderabad specifically and Doha. So one of which is you know, research centers that pour a lot of money from the funds, the QNRF fund, and, you know, uh, collaborate a lot with Education City. I'll mention that later on. Uh, when I talk about the Qatar national vision, the country itself put a, play, uh, a number in place, which is 2030, that, uh, you know, Professor Shatterjee uh, had uh, mentioned something about similar with the 2047 uh, vision that they have when India will be 100 years old, you know, in, in its current status, and uh, the, the, his university will be 50 years old. We are, again, as Ashwin mentioned, we are we're a young university. We know where you stand now. We know what your concerns are. And the country in itself is, you know, a developing country in the region, fast growing. It's working on its brand as Qatar. You know, whenever you, you hear about Qatar, you think about the World Cup. You think about the Qatar Airways, you know, big brands. And, of course, Qatar University is benefiting for, for that. So I will not spend a lot of time on that. I invite you to visit this Qatar National Vision. I think there is a lot of uh, things that are that will be in common with what you are putting in place, especially on the area of human development that Qatar has been uh, working a lot on. Now, um, the university itself started, uh, you know, uh, in 1977. In fact, as a university, it started 1973 as a college of education, became a 1977 uh, university, started growing until, you know, in 2003, there was a reform of the university with our previous president. And currently, we're in the situation where we are in a transformation phase. Uh, so. It tells you also a lot about how we are, uh, you know, approaching our growth and, of course, to cope with the big demands that Qatar as a state and as a nation is putting on us because of the, uh, or thanks to all of the, uh, you know, engagement it has on the international scene and on the local uh, scene at the regional, of course. So basically, uh, these are the, the, you know, what whatever has uh, made us want to go through transformation is all of these things that you can uh, see in front of you. I will not monopolize the time by reading all of these. They, they are, of course, uh, you know, addressing uh, or uh, tar targeting all of us, especially digital transformation. And of course, lately, we might have to add the pandemic itself. So the the. Um, uh, the mission is based on, uh, you know, it's, an, it's a new vision that was put in place. And uh, the, the aim is to be a catalyst for the sustainable socioeconomic development of Qatar. 
you know, not l- long time ago, the uh, Emir of the State of Qatar uh, promised to have, uh, you know, a zero carbon emission World Cup here, and uh, and you 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 know that Qatar University will have to play a big role in that. So uh, that's the, the way we perceive our core mission uh, functions. Uh, again, I will not spend a lot of time uh, on the uh, presentation itself, just to put you in the mood. And of course, we will share this uh, whole thing later on, just to for the sake of uh, gaining time and focusing on the important things we want to discuss here today. The um, uh, three dimensions of QE transformation are based on the education transformation, the institutional transformation, and the impact transformation. And here again, we see the research, social, and the economical, of course, the targeted research, impactful research, meaningful research. That's what we are interested in. Uh, the next uh, slide will show you all the goals of the transformation with the vision, mission, and goals. Um, and uh, you can see that you know we are basically focusing on a national impact. We are focusing on transforming education, transforming the graduates, transforming the research, transforming the institute, transforming the engagement, and enabling transformation, which is like you know the the one that embeds everything. I will leave that here because I will go back to the things that we are that we have in common. You know, uh, there are there are. I, I was just reading that Hyderabad was voted the best city to live in in um, you know uh, in uh, India, and uh, you know uh, this is a very good uh, thing and a very good indicator because uh, Qatar University benefited a lot from the transformation the city of Doha is uh, undergoing, uh, thanks to the transformation that the whole country is having, which is similar to what you are engaging now in. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in the space of a very few years, uh, Qatar became a hub in the region. We want to, you know, believe that we are, if not the, but one of the, you know, best cities to live in in the region. At least it has its its attraction. We know we are sure of this because of the the demands that we have. Uh, the the population is maybe like um, uh, one uh, one fifth of the population of Hyderabad, but it's very varied. We have a majority of uh, expats living in town. Uh, the biggest community, you know, it's not surprising to you, would be the Indian community, of course. And uh, as such, the national university, Qatar University, is the, the is the only national university in town because it's a small country, uh, but is uh, hosting 35 percent. The numbers that uh, uh, you know, um, um, Ashwin gave you about international students represent the highest percentage of international students in the region for national universities, and that is, you know. For a very simple reason, uh, Qataris believe that you know expats are here to help them uh, build their country, and uh, the, the least that they can do is the, to offer their kids uh, a place in uh, higher education. Uh, that, of course, is in parallel with another uh, very big hub that you have, and that will be targeted in the new national policy that you have, which is Education City. Education City is a set of universities coming from the states, top universities, uh, some from the UK. That includes, uh, you know, uh, uh, some specific programs and uh, targets students from Qatar and from the region. And here is something that you will want to debate about. You know, are we uh, welcoming these? Uh, how, how, what, what threats do they offer us? And uh, what are the good things? Well, I can tell you that for Qatar University, it was definitely a very good, healthy competition. Uh, I was mentioning before the Qatar National Research Fund, that is a big fund that is provided by the state of Qatar for its uh, national research priorities. And Qatar University benefits for more than 60% of this uh, research fund. And uh, of course, our first collaborators are our uh, you know, uh, colleagues next door who are the faculty members and students that are in Education City. So basically, you know, what this national policy might be holding for you in Hyderabad is, or in, in Telangana in general, is a very good dawn, which is which will bring in, you know, expertise very close to you. And uh, 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 along with what uh, Ashwin was mentioning about our international students, we have international faculty, a very big number of international faculty, and of course, an international outlook uh, 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 and collaboration on, um, you know, the... Um, uh, the, the the worldwide scene. We have international research collaboration that is one of the highest in the region and uh, and maybe even in the world in some indicators by ranking agencies. So uh, that in uh, that uh, as I tell you is something that you are uh, engaging in, and I, I, I invite you to give it a chance. You know, we know that we all had concerns in Qatar in every part of the world. You know, with these people coming in, you know, these universities coming from outside that might be causing any any uh, you know uh, problems. And uh, on the contrary, it's a very healthy, um, you know, kind of um, 
um, uh, collaboration that will uh, that will grow if you give it you know if it if it goes into uh, the right symbiosis. And here again, I come back to our slide, which is about the transformation, and uh, that's where Qatar University realized that of course you know with with this big player in town, with this big money that is there, it cannot just be the conventional traditional university uh, that it it had been before. Uh, it had to move into something that is more impactful, some, uh, transforming, as you can see from the slide, all parts of the university, all components of the university. And of course, that is a very optimistic uh, kind of strategy. It has been put in 2018. The, our first you know, review will be in 2022. And uh, I can tell you now that it was working pretty well. It, it, it worked even better in the pandemic in some areas, especially digitization and innovation. Uh, and, and I was uh, frightened by, by, by Professor Chatterjee's, uh, you know, uh, quote from Steve Jobs about, uh, you know, trans, about uh, innovation. But you know, I'll take it in the positive sense as, he's expl as, as he has explained it. Uh, so basically, you know, what I want to share with you is that uh, uh, the, the national pro pro, you know, uh, policy that you have also takes care about uh, fee caps which is something that might be a challenge when you talk about this opening up of uh, uh, universities coming from abroad. I'm focusing on that point just to tell you, because I, this is uh, what I see as a good opportunity for Hyderabad to also transform. Uh, and this uh, slide should tell you a lot about how we did, how we transformed uh, in the same context, you know, and at least not the same and very similar uh, context. So basically, you know, um, we have a qualifications network, an excellence framework based on all of these components. And uh, we have student experience framework. So these are the things that are there. I leave it them to you to see them, but I will focus on the you know, red ones speci specifically because I see that these are the ones that are really the, the major uh, components that we are uh, interested in. Uh, the flexibility, uh, national capacity building, exactly like, you know, again, uh, previous speakers were talking about, you know, how uh, Indian students went abroad. We have the same uh, very uh, generous, uh, cap uh, you know, capacity building program that gives scholarships to Qatari nationals to go study abroad. Now we also want them to study in the country or at least have, you know, have them come back and share their experience. Uh, and the QU Education Excellence Framework, I you know it's experiential, competency-based, entrepreneurial. These are, again, uh, the most important ones, digitally enriched, of course, uh, but it has been, you know, <laughs> uh, catalyzed by the uh, by the current situation and the pandemic. And finally, the QU Students Experience Framework, which is uh, based on employability and impact experience and lifelong learning experience. These are the highlights again, I, I, uh, as I tell you. So uh, to cut the long story short, this this transformation was dictated by something very similar to what you are, in, uh, you know, uh, encountering now or engaging in in now. And I hope that you know our our uh, own experience will be helpful uh, for uh, Hyderabad, Telangana, or whoever you 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 know you might uh, feel would be um, uh, you know uh, relevant here. Uh, I will uh, finish by, of course, coming back to rankings because um, I uh, agree with what Ashwin was said partly, uh, which is the part where uh, he is inviting you to consider rankings as a byproduct of what you are doing of your excellence. And I, I, I share with Professor Sabo's interest in our research, research, and research, because this is, according to us, this is where our interests lie. And uh, in, in, fa in fact, uh, I can tell you that uh, the, um, uh, we, we approach rankings in three different ways. You know, we, we talk about the research, which is long term, and that will be uh, the science, uh, sign of excellence for us. And uh, we, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, a data collection that is ongoing, and we talk about the branding, which is a short term. Uh, thing. So basically, this is how we approached our our uh, uh, ranking strategy by uh, focusing on research at the same time launching a very a big research uh, kind of projects. And this is not Qatar University only; it's the country. And it wasn't thinking about ranking back then. Uh, when we th started looking at ranking, we talked about visibility on the short term. We needed to do something about the brand of Qatar University to match the big efforts that Qatar is doing on its own brand in general. And finally, we talked about the um, data collection that, again, uh, you know, uh, Ashwin alluded to, which is which was a challenge. It's a challenge in the whole region, and I see that might also be a challenge in India, and uh, organizing the stuff. And uh, of course, ranking agencies like US have a lot of tools that can help you in that. And um, um, I'll share with you uh, the uh, the um, evolution of the rank so that you can see that we adopted a different strategy than many players in the region. 
we, because of this uh, three triple helix approach, if you want, of research, uh, long-term visibility, short-term, and uh, data, uh, we are moving slowly but surely up the charts. Uh, we don't want to, uh, to to fool anyone. We don't want to fool ourselves. Again, rankings should be um, uh, you know, a byproduct, but we have to appear at our, our real, uh, we have an obligation to appear at our real level. We don't want to be uh, far behind. And I can see that many Indian universities are very good universities, especially the IITs, but they're they're behind in the rankings just because they're not maybe um, aware of these things or not, not playing the game, as we call it in academia. And, uh, you know, uh, this chart shows very, very well the huge improvement at the same time, steady improvement. And, you know, we know that if we don't keep on improving, at least we can maintain our position. And this is definitely what you need to reflect yourselves. And finally, I will finish with uh, the you know subject rankings performance again. Uh, you know, um, well, once we finished the, the first stage of appearing or improving in the overall ranking, we started focusing on the subject rankings because again, as part of the transformation, we want to be serving our community and we want to know where our uh, areas of strength are currently and if they match what we claim to uh, be doing or what we want to. And then, uh, as you can see, the the uh, you know, we started with very few subject ranking, uh, 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 you know, the scores, and now we have a, a very big list of scores. We, these are the the main, uh, you know, ranking uh, agencies we are focusing on. And as you can see, we've been, uh, you know, at least recognized in some areas as top university, as a top university for some areas, and in others we are, of course, aspiring to do more, but we appear in the ranking. And I, I finish by thanking you for this in, invitation. And uh, you know, I hope we can uh, uh, collaborate uh, on, on um, being able to uh, uh, help you through this, uh, learn from you, and uh, you learning from us, uh, hopefully, and uh, visiting you soon, and uh, you know, be there and witnessing the whole thing and receiving you to see how things are in Qatar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Caesar. And I think uh, a lot of what you said actually overlaps uh, with also what Professor Sabo mentions. Uh, and I think that's what is a takeaway for India. So one takeaway for me uh, and one word that has been screaming out of uh, your presentations is investment, investment, investment. Uh, now, I have some other takeaways as well, but I think that's one of the things which Indian institutions, the government should be looking at is uh, providing that uh, without any separation of public, private, uh, deemed, state, central. Uh, so how do you provide that investment? But now the question I have before we wind up for Professor Sabu is you are a private university. Uh, is, that, is that correct? Uh, you're muted, Professor Sabu. Sorry. So no, it's a public university. Oh, it's a public university. So uh, what is the role of government funding in this, uh, Professor Sabu? I mean, do you think it's important? Do you think, uh, what, what should universities in India do in this case? Because um, one of the biggest challenge we find in India is that even public institutions are facing, um, you know, perhaps the availability of funding. And one of the questions from the audience is public spending, spending on education is very low. How will it become a global hub of higher education mm. if the spending doesn't increase? So would you like to take uh, a minute or two to just uh, uh, deliberate on this, please? Yeah. Sure. I think uh, so. most of the funding comes from the government. I mean, in terms of this is actually recognized through our research. So every five years, what we have is that what is known as the research excellence framework. There we look at three aspects. One is the the intensity that you know the, the research environment the, the, the level of research investment within the university second also research impact and the third one is the actually the you know more at the global level like the impact should not be confined within local but uh, more global areas so that ranking actually sort of puts you in a, in a very you know advantageous position to attract government funding so that's that's one second is that actually our funding comes through the uh, student uh, fee i think that's another one the third biggest aspect is actually the funding through research projects. So uh, every year, so I don't have the statistics right in front of me, but I think we we are talking in terms of, uh, you know, over 500 million sometimes, you know, uh, over the period of two to three years or, or five years time. So it's really quite a significant research funding that uh, we are successful at. I think that's one uh, one way of uh, 
The other thing is that actually today, I know that, well, there are big challenges for many institutions and particularly, I mean, Indian institutions are no exception either, but we do have, you know, we do have to think and engage uh, a kind of uh, multilateral, you know, corporate sectors, for example. The, so, so the CSR funding is something that we have probably institutions, universities have not really systematically explored. And part of the reason there is because I think the goals are not clear. So when you seek for corporate or you know CSR type funding, you need to really specify the goals. It's not just you know, for instance, designing or developing a product, but you have to really provide a very clear idea of the goals, objectives, and the long term, you know, short term, and 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 and, and gains, etc. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Sabu. That's that's interesting. Uh, now I'll go over to C's, and this probably might be a bit of controversial. Uh, for you, but I want to put it to you because uh, I think this is this very relevant. Uh, so there's always a conception that well, the Arab region or you know universities region have lots of money and they can do better in rankings. So I want to dispel that myth. I want you to share, despite the funding available, how does Qatar University diligently and maybe a takeaway for Indian institutes that despite even though there is funding available, how do you how do they have to look at um, at a proper spending mechanism or uh, look at CSR or whatever you think um, you know y'all are doing differently? Yeah, definitely, uh, you know, yeah, indeed it's controversial, and you know, yes, in some cases it uh, affects the ranking when you have uh, money, but uh, you know, it's a decision that universities will have to make themselves. Uh, where how do you want to proceed? Do you want to just pay money to be in the rankings, and you know? Well, when everybody reads the rankings, they will just say they should not be there. Or do you want to appear at your own level? And then the spending will be done accordingly. If you want to just be in the rankings, there are tools that, as you know, as we all know, uh, ranking agencies are just you know agencies taking data from everywhere, from our websites, from the from Scopus, from everywhere. So you can affect you know by money, by big money, uh, you can play around with a lot of things and just appear in the rankings. Uh, what I, what our advice is to uh, you know uh, that despite having all this money, if a university in India will have all the money, uh, it, you know it, it diversifies its income. As you said, even if we don't need to have CSR, we don't need to engage with industry. Um, we, the Qatar National Research Fund is a huge fund. It's very beneficial, and we are you know uh, the majority stakeholders. But we still have uh, created our own funding agent, uh, you know, uh, a scheme. Uh, to uh, enhance collaboration, as you know, as Professor Sabo was saying, also you know, not only signing an MOU, engaging the partner in uh, meaningful research, attracting industry income. So it's not because we have the money available that we are not you know doing any effort to get a different type of money, not in the amount, it, it's in the collaboration. Uh, the, this is why not all universities in the region that have enough money are appearing in the ranking so highly because. They might say, you know, my mission is different. My interests are different. I still want to appear in the ranking in my right place, but I don't have to. It's yeah. If if you understand what I'm saying, it's that it's not a direct correlation. You know, you have money, so you appear better in the ranking, or just because you can spend money here and there, you will improve in the ranking. Yes, it has a, a you know a small part of truth. In some uh, cases, it is the it is there. But the fact that you know uh, uh, having money and spending it in the right way is more important on the long term because uh, you get more credibility and you are appearing at your right place. Our challenges are different. Uh, they are not in uh, having access to the money. They are how to use this money to uh, you know uh, really make a, a, an impact on the society and abroad. Uh, well said, Caesar. So I would like to conclude the session with uh, the takeaways from all of you presenters, uh, from both of you presenters. And that has been uh, definitely research and innovation should be at the head of whatever you are doing, along with looking at perhaps uh, CSR funding, if you can't get direct government funding, looking at projects with the industry and so on. Uh, branding is important. So while you are uh, while you are a good university, not everybody might be aware of you. So you should be you should be working on on branding. Uh, investment uh, across these areas as well. Uh, agile leadership, um, at right at the right from the top through the institution. Uh, employability and engagement with alumni is one of them as well. And um, I, I and partnerships as well. Partnerships around the world. Partnerships with uh, institutions, countries, cities which have a similar uh, thought uh, as thought. Um, 
process as you. So there are a couple of takeaways which we'll present uh, later on to the to the minister at the closing plenary, and I, I will draft this up and I'll also send you copies. But this is great, and I think with your uh, recordings and and presentation, this will add so much of value to Telangana to actually pave the way forward as it walks into becoming a global higher education hub. And I'm sure uh, the uh, the organizing committee at FICI and uh, also the government appreciates your comments, appreciates your time, and perhaps if you are available for for contribution or consultation later, I'm I'm sure they would like to invite you back for for more discussions. So with that, I would like to really thank Professor Sabu. We can see the sun is already uh, uh, yes. uh, rising there for you. So maybe start, it, was, it was dark. So really appreciate waking up so early in the morning. Uh, we're really uh, humbled by that. And Caesar, we are almost in the same time zone, but it's great to have you with, with us. And uh, I would like to sign off and thank uh, thank you all for for coming. So uh, over to you, over to our uh, um, our our, our panelists. Uh, Who's going to take over from here? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Shun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caesar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.